I'm delighted to continue some of the teaching about the theory of human caring and the essence of it, which I mentioned before has the language of the 10 Caritas processes. These 10 Caritas processes are actually considered universals of human caring. When you are practicing caring, this is what you're actually doing, and this is the way in which you are being, but you may not be aware of it. So by giving language and voice and action to these 10 Caritas processes, you can actually be more confident. You can be more poised. You can be more professional. You will have the ability to articulate your practice and have a shared language. And it is a reminder for all of us that we're in this very hectic postmodern world, which is acknowledging if you don't have your own language, you don't exist. And nursing being the largest health profession in the world, and yet largely we've been invisible because we don't have our language to describe to the public or to our other professional colleagues what caring is in relation to our daily practice. So these 10 Caritas processes provide you with a language and a shared way in which you can communicate and articulate your professional practice. So the starting point, as I mentioned before, has to do with you. You are the ultimate instrument. We are the human instrument. We are the light in the institutional darkness. But caring starts with self and fulfilling these values that bring us to this field in the first place that we have a responsibility to offer to the public. But how in the world do we sustain these humanistic, altruistic values of compassionate service if we do not take care of ourselves first. So the very first Caritas process has to do with offering loving kindness and equanimity and to love with yourself, loving kindness and tenderness to yourself first and cultivating this as a daily practice. Hospitals that are doing this work, they may take a whole month just for the nurses to engage in systematic attention to the practice of loving kindness and equanimity and kindness, gentleness, tenderness with themselves so we can have compassion for self. Therefore, we have compassion for our colleagues. We have compassion for our patients and for the families and all the emotional turmoil that we go through in our daily life. So the first Caritas process has to do with that foundational starting point. And in the earlier sequence, I actually started with the singing bowl, which is calibrated to the heart, because the heart vibration actually energetically communicates these higher vibration feelings of compassion and love from our heart. Our heart actually sends more messages to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. So if we don't have a practice of compassion for ourselves in our heart center, we actually can be unkind to ourselves. We can be unkind to other people without even intending that to be the case. So this takes a professional commitment and a personal commitment to adhere to and cultivate the practice of loving kindness with yourself. This can be done in the instant. It can be done in a systematic way. It can be done on the, on the floor in the moment that you're actually practicing by pausing and breathing into this space. So that's the very first Caritas process. The second Caritas process has to do with your ability to be authentically present to another person. And in that authentic presence, in this heart-centered awareness, this kindness, this compassionate space, you actually are helping that person to enable the faith and hope about their outcome. We know there's a great deal of research on the role of prayer, faith, hope, religion, and belief systems and value systems, the meaning a condition has for a person, all is contributing to their outcome and how they engage in this process for themselves. So by your presence, your authenticity, your ability to be there and hold that space, you can actually are enabling the faith and hope for that other person. So that's the second Caritas process. The third Caritas process has to do again back to you and your ability to mature and be sensitive to yourself and your own feelings and emotions. 
It's like honoring the complexities of our personality, even those parts that we may not like, but we know that this is part of who we are. So we bring light into our own shadow side as well as understanding that this is an ongoing life journey for all of us to learn to be more sensitive to ourselves, so that we can be more sensitive to another person. This is highly related to the compassion if we are able to have sensitivity and kindness and compassion with ourselves, then we're able to be more sensitive and have compassion to the other person. And this is a lifelong journey that we take both personally and professionally as we continue to offer and be accountable for offering and being essence of the caring theory and offering caring to the world. The fourth Kirtas process has to do with developing authentic trusting relationships. Without the first two or three processes, you can't develop a, an authentic trusting, helping relationship with another person. So they all build upon each other. Although these are not a linear sequencing of these processes, it's like a conscious gestalt. You're holding the whole field in any given moment. But these are guides that help you to sustain and be reminded of what you're actually doing and how you are being in a given moment. So the ability to develop authentic trusting relationships is tied to your ability to be sensitive to yourself. It's tied to your ability to have authentic presence. It's tied to your ability to have the sustainability, sustaining values of loving kindness and compassion for yourself. So the patients themselves have often told us that having a trusting relationship with their practitioner is one of the most important ingredients of their experience in a hospital and whether they've had a successful outcome. So you can see how important this is. The fifth Kirtas process has to do with expressing and allowing for positive and negative feelings. Research has shown that if you can allow a person to express both positive and negative feelings, you actually are contributing to healing outcomes for that person. It actually is helping them to express themselves, to take those anger, that fear, that anxiety, that tension that's confusing them in their inner mind and put it into an outside form so they can see themselves, they can hear themselves differently, they can begin to have new meaning for their own experience. So this too is part of the process of, of, number, of number five of a, allowing for the expression of positive and negative feelings. This too is part of some of the classic research that's been done about patients' experience of human caring from nurses. This is classic research that was done in Iceland, but it's universal in that some patients describe some of their nurses as actually making them feel worse. So you can see how this caring moment and your presence in that given moment can either help somebody feel better or make them feel worse. It can be unkind and unsuccessful in terms of helping them with their health and healing. So this work has shown, too, that some nurses describe, some patients describe their nurses as making them feel uh, cold or uncared for or robotic. So this moves from some of the terminology of being toxic or biocidic to something that's referred to as bioactive, which is a more classic caring relationship with a patient, to what's referred to as biogenic. The biogenic field is where you have this loving kindness compassionate experience with the patient in a given moment. And the biogenic moment and this process of being present in that way is life-giving and life-receiving for both the patient and for the, you as the nurse. So this too is part of developing that trusting, helping relationship and is a continuation of all of these uh, Kertos processes together. The sixth Kertos process has to do with what we all know and love and have learned about the nursing process, except it takes the nursing process to an entirely different level. 
of moving beyond just problems because we know now in our new science that if you focus on problems, you're going to have bigger and bigger focus on that problem is going to get bigger and bigger. So this is an opportunity for us to use the creativity, our gifts and talents in ways that we can be creative, use multiple ways of knowing. We actually can engage in a creative process of solution seeking. It moves us into new models of coaching and counseling patients on self-care, on self-knowledge, on self-treatment. So you can actually participate and have the patient engage in their own creative process along with you. So you're co-creating this caring process together. The seventh care toss process has to do with the educational role that nurses have always played, but now it's not just didactically giving people information and health teaching in the traditional way. It's about working with that person's subjective meaning, their inner life world, and what they are understanding. So you work from their frame of reference, not your frame of reference. And this moves, too, to a very relational, caring moment with that person in the teaching process so that you can actually engage them in the understanding of what they need to know at that point in time. The eighth care toss process has to do with the environment. So in this one, it becomes very important to understand that ultimately we are the environment because our energetic presence, our ability to have compassion, loving kindness, authenticity, presence, consciousness, intentionality, a caritas consciousness in that moment with that person holding space for them to be seen, to be heard, to know they matter, that becomes part of understanding that we become the healing environment. We can be in the most beautiful, magnificent hospital setting, the most modern in the world. And if you have practitioners who are biocidic, you're going to have a very unhealthy environment for yourself and for our practice and for our patients and our communities. So the eighth care toss process is really important because we are creating the environment. We're repatterning the environment. We are the energetic environment. We are the light in the institutional darkness for our humanity. The ninth care task process has to do with our basic needs. If there's any one thing that nurses are involved in is taking care of patients with assisting them with their basic needs. But in this consciousness, in this theory, we really are very reverential and understanding that these basic needs have to be responded to with fullness of dignity, with humility, with compassionate service to these, to these others, that this becomes a sacred act that we offer to the best of what is needed for that person at that, at that time that they cannot do for themselves. So this becomes a very important basic foundational physical need of which we are embedded and grounded in the caring theory through these basic physical care acts as sacred acts. The tenth care task process has to do with not knowing all the answers. It invites humility. It invites an unknown ways that are already present for people's experiences. For example, we increasingly see miracles and mysteries and unknowns that cannot be explained in a traditional Western, modern, medicalized view of humanity or of medical science. These are phenomena that are human experiences across time that millions of people have reported that we have to be open to. So the 10th care task process is just being open to and allowing for mysteries and miracles and staying within the other person's experience so that miracles can indeed happen. We'll have a new book coming out shortly in the next month or two on nurses' experiences of having miracles with their patients. So this is a summary of the 10 Kertos process as a brief overview, but with these 10 Kertos processes, as you become familiar with them, you will see that they can serve as a guide for your practice, for your education, and for your own personal and professional development. So I'm going to stop at this point, and I will be doing a continuation of another series that will follow in terms of application and implementation in clinical practice.